So good evening and welcome to the Beaver Island Historical Society special Earth Day presentation. My name is Lori Taylor Blitz and I am the Society's Director. I have a Master's in Historic Preservation and I've been employed by the Society since 2017. A little bit about the Beaver Island Historical Society. We were founded in 1957 to collect and share the fascinating history of our island and the archipelago. Um, most of you probably know everything about Beaver Island, but for those who've never visited, I'm going to tell you we're a remote island in Lake Michigan. The island has witnessed many interesting and unique historical events. Uh, we've been home to various groups, including Native Americans, uh, a Mormon branch of people known as the Strangites, Irish immigrants, fishermen, lumberjacks, and many more. We operate two museums on the island, the Print Shop Museum, which you can see in the background. I'm in the print shop right now. Uh, we have another museum called the Marine Museum. And we have two additional historical sites called Heritage Park and the Protar Home. We offer several resources and services to our visitors, including genealogical research, copy of archival photos, and a series of historical journals and books for purchase. Additionally, we host many events throughout the year to promote the island's history. So uh, before we get started, I want to just give a little bit of housekeeping about how we're going to go through the process of, hang on, we got a couple more people waiting to come in, uh, how this event is going to flow. So as you're coming in, please mute your microphones. And once Sarah starts to give um, her presentation, I'm going to ask you all to turn off your cameras. If you don't know how to turn off your cameras, I can work in the background and go and turn them off for you. Uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, Dr. Sarah Warber will take your questions and answer them. Uh, how we would like to do that is to have you submit them through the chat so that I can see what the questions are. And then when we get to the end of her presentation, I can call upon you and ask you to um, unmute your microphone and you can ask in person or you can just put in the chat, Lori, please ask her this question. And I'll be happy to ask the question for you. So today's event was selected to honor Earth Day and the history of Kidinoque and Garden Island. So I just did a little bit of background research. Um, Earth Day began in 1970 and gave a voice to an emerging public consciousness about the state of our planet. This event is a partnership with the organization, the Menis Kitty Kitchen Drum, and their organization was created by Kitanoque in the 1970s. The title of our program is Kidanoque, a garden of Garden Island, a story of hope and healing. And with me tonight is medical doctor, Sarah Warber. Dr. Warber is a clinical professor emerita of family medicine at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where she co-founded the integrative medicine program. Her research focuses on how holistic health programs and time spent in nature affects human well-being. She has authored numerous articles and chapters about holistic medicine, nature-based interventions, and the processes of healing. And she completed a Fulbright scholarship on nature deficit disorder at the European Center for Environment and Human Health at the University of Exeter located in the UK. She is currently a scholar at the Institute for Integrative Health in Baltimore, Maryland. And there she is exploring how women's expressive arts illuminate their dreams of nature, health, a balanced life, and a balanced life. So with that being said, will you all please welcome medical doctor Sarah Warber. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> 
So uh, as Sarah gets started, once again, please turn off your cameras and we'll get it down to where she will be the only person um, that the only lovely face you'll get to look at for a while. Thank you all. I hope you enjoy the program. And thank you, Lori. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. I want to thank all of you who've uh, who've come tonight. It's such an interesting thing that we can do this without um, leaving our homes. I, as an introvert, I absolutely love that. Uh, I'm in my element. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm also a little bit technically challenged. So we hope that uh, I'm going to be able to do the, all the right things here. So here we go. So we have a slide set and we're going to tell it to show slides and we'll see how long it takes it to do that. Did it start the video? All right, there it goes. Okay, somebody's not, un not muted. Um, So uh, you all saw the title. Of course, we have to just put it up here again, just in case um, you didn't catch it. Um, Kiwade Nokwe uh, is the woman we're going to talk about today um, and about the, the story of how uh, I learned from her. Um, one of the things that I <clears throat> find a lot of my colleagues doing as they um, begin their talks is to acknowledge uh, where they are and to acknowledge the uh, people who, um, whose land this is. So we are currently, I am currently in the land of the Anishinaabe. And you can see this um, dark line which shows their traditional cultural area. I'm speaking to you from the western coast of Michigan, very near the shores of Lake Michigan. And we're going to talk about if you I, can you see my pointer? There's Beaver Island, and right next to it is Garden Island, part of the Okay, I'm not, I can't even say archipelago, archipelago. Um, Kiwe Nokwe is a, is, was um, a woman of mixed native and European heritage. Uh, she studied with a, an herbalist uh, when she was a little girl and she grew up in a village on the northern Leelanau Peninsula uh, and did not have to go to a um, the kind of school where they tried to um, assimilate native peoples. So she had a very special upbringing with her grandfathers and her parents, uh, both enculturating her in the Christian approach, but also in the native spiritual approach. This is me when I was on the island for the first time in 1985. I show you this picture because I, I think there are difficulties in people uh, potentially appropriating native thoughts and ideas and uh, doing that in, in ways that are not honoring of the people themselves. I am a person of European descent. And I remember one time talking about that in, in, when I was near Key, she was kind of listening in the background and I was talking with another woman. We were 
rattling off our heritages. And he finally said, I am so offended. And the reason she was so offended was she said, when I named you, I adopted you. You are Anishinaabe. I think that's an, that's shocked me, really. Um, and so I am of European descent and I am adopted Anishinaabe. This is something like everybody's first view of Garden Island if you're coming to see Grandmother Key. It's a lonely looking place, but amazingly beautiful. And once you're off the boat and have thrown your gear onto some kind of a conveyance or maybe your own back, you walk across this bridge and into the camp. I can tell you that the first time I ever crossed this bridge, I fell into tears as I realized that I was coming home, coming home to my true home. Later on, I sat with Grandmother Key in her cabin and I told her this. And I told her how I wanted to learn about the plants. I told her how I was going to study to be a doctor and that I, I so very much wanted to be able to use the plants, be able to teach the plants, be able to work with the plants. And she said to me, well, you know, that's all very good, but you really have to understand the philosophy too. Again, I was a little taken aback. Probably this is a story of Key always kind of rattling me. And I said, of course, I, I'll be happy to learn the philosophy. That, that fascinates me too. Um, and this was a theme that came throughout our teachings in that she truly thought that it wasn't necessarily the molecules that made up the plant that did the healing. She felt and I embrace that it is the spirit of the plant that does the healing. And when we respect and honor the spirit of the plant, as we ask for the medicine, the plant will give that willingly and joyfully when we ask. And that is how we can make good medicines. This is a picture of the main path going down from the, the camping area into the interior of Garden Island. And a picture of um, Indian pipes uh, coming up out of the ground. This environment there is rich and lush with all kinds of plant life and animal life. And it was so delightfully protected and cared for by the humans that were coming and, and learning from Key. There was a tenderness towards nature that I had never seen before, had never experienced it before. If you go deep into the center of the island, you come across these ferns that go on forever and ever. You feel like you've, you've stepped into this primordial land and, and that probably you should be seeing dinosaurs pretty soon. 
it's really otherworldly in all kinds of ways. And as I got used to this new place and all the things that went on there, I pretty quickly found out that this teaching thing about plants and philosophy was not going to happen like I learned at school. It was going to be a meandering path. And it was going to involve doing a lot of things that had nothing to do, or my rational mind might say had nothing to do with learning about plants and philosophy. Uh, pretty much be prepared to do whatever he wants you to. So here I am displaying a spirit wand that I made because he wanted spirit wands made and taken to the cemetery to honor the people uh, who, uh, the gone befores who were there. This is just one of the many odd things that I did uh, on my way to learning the plants. But what I found was making things was deeply satisfying and particularly making gifts to exchange with others on the island uh, was deeply satisfying. And I think that's something that we can all take into our lives now during this pandemic time of practicing that making and gift giving. At the end of each day, people would gather under the kitchen tarp. Somebody would light the lanterns. And Grandmother Key would tell a story. This was a wonderful time. Everybody was snuggled close together or wedged close together all around the circle. And somebody would make popcorn, popcorn. Maybe it would be flavored with wild leeks that someone had gathered that day. It was a boisterous and loving time. And grandmother always left us spellbound as she told her stories. My own life uh, became complicated in 1990, just five years after I started coming to Garden Island by this little fella, Sagan, many of you on this call know him. And I love this picture of grandmother showing her delight in this little, little guy who came all the way from Peru to be part of our family. And interestingly, when I had hoped to have a child, I petitioned Key to, to guide me. And so there was a lot of prayer that happened on Garden Island that brought this little fella. In 1992, uh, I went out on Vision Quest. Grandmother felt that it was uh, in, incredibly important to know what your life purpose was and that you would be guided by your guardians if you just knew who they were and that people could um, reorder their whole lives by going on a vision quest. She told me once that the first time she put someone who was not a native out on vision quest, she thought that she would probably get struck with lightning. 
but to her amazement, she didn't. And that person came back with all the answers, even though they were not Native. And she realized what she knew in her heart, that we're all the same, that spirit cares about all of us, and spirit will speak to all of us when we come with an open heart and the questions that we need to ask. Doing the vision quest changed my life. I was going to be a radiologist and grandmother Key had suggested that when it was time to choose my specialty would be a good time to do a vision quest. So one of my questions was, what kind of a doctor am I supposed to be? And it became very apparent that I was supposed to be a family medicine doctor, which terrified me because that meant I was gonna to have to be a real doctor, talking to real people and not just looking at cool images of their bones and the way their physiology worked. Grandmother, talked to me while I was on that vision quest. And she said, you know, you can ask for help. And help I received abundantly. It was an amazing time. And one that I will always cherish. It became a defining time of who I am and what my life has been like. This is sort of a typical early summer scene on Garden Island. You notice the coats and the layers and there's nothing attractive or, or uh, set up about it. And this is the month after I graduated from medical school, before I started my residency I'm homeless, essentially, because I've left my apartment in East Lansing and haven't gone into my apartment at University of Michigan. And the boy has chicken pox. And when next we see me, I'm a resident. I'm a doctor. I am learning all of this medicine. I'm doing it. And all the kinds of things that Grandmother Key had talked to me about, about how important family was and community and understanding someone's history, the family history, all of it began to fall into place along with what I was doing as a family doctor. And this is also the time when because of my residency and their willingness to strike a bargain with me, I was able to spend four months out of each year for three years. And those four months were spent with grandmother. And what we did was we distributed those four months over the seasons. And so I would spend a month in the winter at her home in called Holy Hill in Leland. And this is the herb room there. Uh, and one of my jobs was to tend the herb room. I learned an incredible amount of what I know about herbs just by keeping these jars filled finding what she needed when someone called her, getting it ready to send out, making medicines in her kitchen. And I also learned from listening to her as she talked to people on the phone, people would call, they would have needs. And I would hear, I realized that 
as grandmother listened, she had tears going down her cheeks. It was such a, again, a surprising thing to me. You know, no doctor would let themselves cry about their patient, at least not where anybody could see them. She felt so deeply about people and she listened so carefully and she spoke so wisely. And afterwards, she would tell me something like, we need to get this medicine ready for this person and send it to them. I don't know what we're going to do. Let's go and do prayers. And so when she didn't know what the answer was, and that was many times, she would say her prayers and then she would say, we let it be with the spirits. The spirits will take care of things. And sure enough, they did, along with whatever help Key could offer. And sometimes that help went extended all the way to inviting someone to come into her home and live in her presence for days, weeks, months, so that they could have good food, they could be surrounded by in a, in a supportive life, they would be involved in prayers daily to the four directions, to Creator, to Mother Earth, they would be being placed back into harmony by just being in the presence and the milieu that he created, whether that was at Holy Hill or whether that was at Garden Island. She had an amazing generosity of spirit in that way. And again, it contrasted so deeply with what I saw as a physician. We would never get that involved. This is a picture in the front room at Holy Hill. And this is Grandmother Key with her longtime friend, Martha Best. And those of us from Minas Kittigan, we often saw these two sitting together. They met when Key went to the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And because they were single women, they decided they'd, they'd look out after each other and became fast friends. Some of the things you see behind her, one of the, my favorites is the, the big whale vertebrae hanging over the mantle. Uh, I loved the way Grandmother Key would sort of meld nature with what we might normally think of as household contents. Uh, in that way, she was very like my own grandmother who had geodes and owl pellets among the crystal and the china. This is a, a favorite picture of Key. This picture was taken just three years before she passed over. She's on Garden Island. She is absolutely ecstatic about this gift of a yoke to carry water. One of the jobs daily was to get water out of the lake. And she thought this was the nicest thing anybody could give her. And you see in this picture her exuberance for life. She was somebody who was curious. She had an incredible sense of humor. She was syncretic. She would take from anything, any philosophy, any culture, anything that made sense. If it was practical, if it was useful, if it fit, she would bring it into her life. 
I often wondered why she was like that. And she told me that her teacher, Nojimakwe, was so fascinated to learn. If she heard of any medicine person who was in the area, she would be the first one to knock on their, their wigwam flap and um, ask to learn more. So Key was inculcated with this uh, passion for learning uh, from an early age. So I don't know exactly when this picture was taken. On the back of it, it says, the doctor is in. And this is me in the Mashkiki wig, where we made the medicines, where we brought what we collected off of from Garden Island, having collected those herbs and medicines with this honoring of the spirit, uh, the caring for not taking too much, caring for the ongoing of the plant, assuring that ongoing and then making the medicines with this spirit of love and concern for the people who would eventually use it. One of the things that was very interesting, amazing, and essential was to be able to keep this spirit completely positive around the making of these medicines. I've often thought that I would like to be able to see a little logo on the medicines I buy in the, in the Whole Foods or wherever that would say made with the plants, the spirit of the plants and with positive spirit of the people. At about the time that Key passed, I was finishing my fellowship and starting into my own practice of medicine. And I thought about how could I explain to people what I understood and how could I explain it to patients and use what Key taught me within the confines of the dominant healthcare system but always with an eye to be changing it from within. And so I took what Key had told me about the fact that you needed to be healing the mind, the body, the heart, and the spirit, and placed that at the center of this diagram. And I would ask patients, questions that would help me to understand where they had strengths and where they had challenges using this paradigm. And then we could see where they were out of balance and I could diagram that for them and show them that. And I think that had a profound help to patients that I worked with. We also could put into their lives, their family, their community, their relationship with their environment and with the spirit. These concentric circles also deeply affected the research that I've done and the way that I think about outcomes in health that are important. So, I said upon following my own sun trail, by this time Key has passed. In the fall after she passed, we opened up the University of Michigan Complementary and Alternative Medicine Research Center with funding in the millions from the NIH. And this uh, set in motion a whole program of beginning to respect people's use of complementary, alternative, holistic, however you want to call it, 
in conjunction with medicine, with Western medicine. And I believe that all of the things that I and my colleagues did actually have changed that university. We set about to educate health professionals so that they wouldn't be afraid of these alternatives. We, in 2003, created an integrated family medicine clinic where we started to see patients using things like I was just telling you about, this idea of balancing what was strong and what was still needed work on. I looked back at my journals at one point in time and found that in this time period, I wrote in my journal, I just want to figure out how I can practice medicine and, and work with the plants. And so that became uh, what I was able to do, what I was able to share with people was that knowledge of the plants. My research has also involved um, working with healers, uh, listening to their stories and translating that into um, papers that physicians might read and change their ways. Continued to work with people in the UK around healing and what healing really is and how we interact when we are healing. While I was at Michigan, I met my good friend and colleague, Catherine Irvine, and we continued to work together for all of these years, 20 some years now, on how nature help, helps us, how we helps our health, at that time, there were lots of people interested in the toxic effects of nature and the pollution and problems that we've created, but very few people were linking being in nature with something that was actually beneficial for our health. And one of the interesting things about the pandemic, pandemic is that all of a sudden, everybody gets it. Oh, I'm stuck in my house. Wow, I feel so much better when I go take a walk outside. And then one of the things that I've really enjoyed is doing a consultation with the World Health Organization on how we can integrate traditional complementary medicine with Western medicine. And in doing that, I had the wonderful opportunity to go to Africa and India and meet traditional healers and alternative providers. And it was what grandmother taught me that allowed me that to be the kind of respectful listener, the curious, the syncretic person who could say, this can all work together. We can figure out how to make this work together. This is a part of our reality now. This is a, a painting by Banksy, who is a street artist. Uh, no one knows who Banksy is. Um, this breaks my heart. This would have, this breaks, would have broken Key's heart. She, like I feel now, those tears she would feel those tears. But she would also say, we have a philosophy. We have a way of knowing. And sometimes she said, it's very simple. And maybe people don't think it's important enough because it's so very simple. The first principle is, and the goal of life, is bimata ziwan, which is a Nishinaabe word, which is very difficult to uh, translate. I've, I've heard it 
translated our good life. Grandmother translated as it as life in the fullest sense. So when I think about my patients, that's what I wanted for them. I wanted them to have life in the fullest sense. When I think about myself and my family and my friends, I want them to have life in the fullest self sense. She believed that knowing your spirit directed life purpose was critical. And that when you knew that you could do things you had no idea that you could possibly do. She believed in harmonious relationships, peace and harmony all throughout the family community, all and continuing out into nature, into our relationships with spirit. She also taught us to think about our relations not being just in this time, but being linked into the past, to the gone befores, and linked into the future, to the seventh generation. And so when we think and talk and make decisions, we're in this matrix, if you will, of time and the society around us, including the society of nature. And that is interconnectedness. We are all interconnected. Every time we make a move, there is a reverberation in this interconnected world. Many of you will remember this sign. This is on the, the kitchen. Love is the language we all long to hear. Speak love. I think this says it all. When we despair, keep loving. When we're tired, keep loving. When we're a little angry, keep loving. I come back to this over and over again. I love this picture of Key because it is, it feels to me like she is, as I remember her, somehow in this world and not in this world. And of course, as a gone before herself now, she's very much in this liminal space. What do you think she would say to us now? This is a time of crisis for Mother Earth and all her life forms. Climate crisis, biodiversity loss, pollution, and pandemic because of our ways of mastery rather than harmony. But we have ways of reconnecting with Mother Earth and with the Great Spirit. We can live more simply. We could embrace a gift economy rather than an extractive-based economy. We can practice an earth-based spirituality. We can practice compassion. We can be love. We can humble ourselves beside each other, the animals, the plants, the singing rocks. We can heal each other. We can open to healing within nature. We can change our hearts. We can follow our hearts. We can find true joy in clear purpose. We can be the ones who make the difference. Peace and harmony, laughter and love. Come home to nature and to spirit and to community. Come home to kinship across species, across time, across Mother Earth. 
The work takes each one of us choosing in each moment the path of destruction or the path of regeneration. Scarlet Tanager speaks to me. We are dying, but we will come back. This is just the tip of my little iceberg. There's books about key uh, and about the plants. These are all available on Amazon. And I believe the key Wade Nokway stories from my youth and Cedar Songs is available at the print shop. Key wrote a lot about the, the the culture, the stories, the herbs. And uh, these books are available from the Minas Kittigan Drum at a fairly nominal fee. And uh, Lee Boisfort uh, has asked that you can call her. And I'm going to say this out loud so you can jot it down if you like 231 631 3542 to order books. It's amazing how much grandmother did to influence so many people. She did that through her writing, but she did that through the hundreds of lives that she taught, she touched. And the stories that people have, while they may have some overlap with the story that I've told you, each of our stories is different. Each of our stories is ours alone. And I'm so happy to have been able to share mine with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you so very much. That was a, a lovely presentation. Uh, Sarah, can you hear me? Let me just make sure my mic. Yes, goes. I can. So I'd like to say if you've enjoyed this programming and you would like to make a free will donation, you can visit our website, which is beaverislandhistory.org, or you can mail, you know, a donation to our address, which is P.O. Box 263, Beaver Island, 49782. Um, as part of our programming, we are splitting all of our donations that we might happen to receive with the um, Minis Kittigan. Kittigan drum. So I uh, just wanted to share that if anybody's interested in making a contribution to uh, both organizations. <clears throat> um, and as um, our presenter said, those two books are available in our gift shop as well. And so are a couple of the publications about the Stone Circle. <clears throat> so um, oh, and I have got a couple other books that the groups might be interested in. There are other books about Native American history, the plants of Beaver Island, and of course I said the Stone Circle publication. So our talk back session will begin now. So if you have any questions, please put them into the chat and I will um, ask you to unmute and let you, you know, ask directly, or I can read your questions for you. So while the group is thinking about any possible questions they might have, <clears throat> oh, let's see, I think we have our first question. <clears throat> May we have that phone number again? So uh, could you please repeat that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh... All right, 231-631-3542. So uh, here's a question for you. And it is from Sean Gallagher. Sean, would you like to unmute your microphone and ask uh, Dr. Werber? Okay, so I will. Just says no. 
<laughs> Please tell us about the herbs you gathered on Garden Island and the benefits or cures they provided. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, you have to live with me for 14 years. <laughs> That's how I learned it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Um, let me tell you about one herb that I think um, is, is a wonderful story. And, and that is St. John's wort. Probably a lot of you, if you're into alternative medicine of some kind, you probably heard about St. John's wort and because it kind of took the America by storm. Uh, it had been researched in Europe for years and years and years as an antidepressant. And suddenly everybody in um, America wanted to take St. John's wort because of course we're actually de depressed, you know, and nobody wants to go to the doctor about that after all. I mean, why would you? Um, the interesting thing is that grandmother thought the world of St. John's wort, but it wasn't for that reason at all. She said it was the best mender of skin ever anywhere and so we all who spend any time out there spend a lot of time on our knees gathering saint john's wort in order to make saint john's wort salve which was used for healing wounds and we were on our knees because it's a short little plant and you really got to get down on your knees to be able to gather that it's a wonderful plant and an amazing Amazing stuff to have in your medicine cabinet. So our next question is from Terry. Terry, would you like to unmute your mic and ask Sarah your question? Oh, she said, is that the same one? Please read. So can you, this is, I'll read it for her, Sarah. Can okay. you give a specific example of a time when someone came to keynote Dinoque for help and she prayed and it left with spirit. How did the spirit answer the prayer? So what he taught me about praying is that you pray for the highest good in this situation and that you recognize that as a human, you do not know what that is. And by putting it that way, uh, what I, the stories that I heard her tell, you know, where I got some follow-up on that, it was often surprising what happened. It wasn't what you might expect. Um, and, and I'm being a little bit general here um, because I think, you know, my doctor ethics say that somebody else's um, health challenges and their process is, you know, is their own. It is, it is something that they entrust to you as a healer and and don't expect to have that shared publicly. Um, Jean B, would you like to ask your question directly? If so, could you please unmute, unmute your mic? Okay. Okay. I was wondering if you ever spent time with uh, Osaman, Judy Meister, uh, and Key. I can imagine the um, the laughter and and the work that might have gone on if you did work together. Uh, yes, I I did um, work with Osaman because the the way that you learned was not necessarily by learning directly from key, but it would always be by learning from the people who had already learned more than you know, than you know and who were taking responsibility for making the medicines, gathering the medicines. And so Osaman was one of those. She um, 
was deeply steeped in all of that lore uh, long before I was. And so she was, um, she was amazing. She did have a very uh, a great sense of humor. And she also, I think um, she liked to speak cryptically a little bit. So there was always something that wasn't quite direct about what she said. And you really had to uh, work at it to understand her meaning. Um, so she always made, she never made it exactly easy. Um, and she was great to go for a hike with because uh, she knew all kinds of things. Not. And, and I must say, he was phenomenal to go for a, a, a herb walk with. I had a couple of opportunities when she was in good health to be able to do that. And um, you just wish you could memorize everything she was saying. Thank you. Okay, I have another question for you. <clears throat> Oh, where did, how many people of the Minikis and Drum go to Garden Island every year and can anybody go? <laughs> well, when I first learned about it, um, you definitely, uh, you, it was like you had to know somebody to get there. There was no easy way and, um, and I would still say there has to be human to human connection with people from that are already parts of Minas Kittigan drum. Um, it's not like you can uh, sign up on the web and you know register and and uh, you know pay your fees and have a a an experience. It's not like that. Um, it's about becoming part of a community, becoming part of a family. And there's commitment and exchanges of energy that take place. Um, how many people come? I guess it depends on the year. I was, as I was thinking about this talk, there was a time when I went and there were only four of us on the island with grandmother. And there were times when I've been there when there were 25 people, maybe, mm. like pretty full camp. You got to feed all those people every day. And, and that takes a lot of community exchange and effort to get that job done. Well, oh, here we have another question. I was just about to say, I think we're done. Okay. Uh, Carol, would you like to unmute your mic and ask Sarah your question? Hey. Hey, darling. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I won't tell any nasty stories about you. You won't. Though I, though I could. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering if you would tell people about some of the specific things that you re did research on had to do research on to convince your West, more Western leaning colleagues um, about the medicinal benefits of things. And I'm thinking specifically of balsam fur sap mm, and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how do you go to a professor and say, I wanna study balsam fur sap and it's beneficial, you know, uh, it's benefits for like burns or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can imagine the look on their faces. Yeah, you know, well, so that's a that's a great uh, setup. Thank you very much. Um, when I was in medical school, I was at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine to distinguish it from the College of Veterinary Medicine. And um, uh, we, we could take an elective in our fourth year. And I went to them and I said, well, I would spend that elective with key. And I, I, at that point, I'd done my vision quest and I knew that I was supposed to learn the plants. That was part of what I learned on that vision quest. And, um, you know, I was in the right place at the right time because they 
were very supportive of that. And, um, and so, so that was the first time I spent time at Holy Hill with Key in the, in the off year, off, off part of the year. And she was really happy and excited. She loved balsam fir and she thought it was the most wonderful stuff. And she, she told me lots of stories and I would listen to the stories and then I would write them down. And, and she was, I never wrote notes while I was listening to her. I always would listen, just full on listening. And then the next morning before I got, went back downstairs again, I would sit in my bed and I would write everything that I could remember. And then I might ask her a question, you know, later the day, next day, if I didn't quite get it or something like that. So she, she kind of um, taught me all these stories and I, and so I'm writing them down. And then, um, then I started looking into the literature to see what was in the medical literature and what, what was this stuff and what was it made out of and what were its properties and why did it, why did it, why did it do what it would do? And for, for everybody who doesn't know, balsam fir sap, um, the balsam fir has this little kind of a, a blister on his bark and inside that blister is sap. And when that sap comes out and, it, and you place it on a burn, it'll harden over the burn and, and like create a skin. So burn care is incredible incredibly difficult to do. It's incredibly painful. They're constantly changing bandages and basically ripping at the skin to keep it clean and, and, and try to protect the body from infection because that's what our skin does. It keeps the infection out. It keeps our body fluids in. Well, balsam fir sap is perfect for that. It keeps, it makes a sealed covering it keeps the infection out, it keeps the body fluids in, and that new skin can grow underneath there and be and do it just very nicely. Um, it does, especially on Garden Island, it will get, you know, like covered with debris sticking to the sap and it looks absolutely awful. So don't go to the ER with the balsam sir, for sap on there because they will freak out just trust it and uh, just wait till it kind of peels off and you can look at your new skin. Thank you for that question. The next question is from Terry. Uh, Terry, would you like to unmute your mic again and ask your question? Um, yeah, this is so wonderful. So um, I noticed in the promo bio that you're doing work in Baltimore about expressive arts and well-being. And I just wondered if you could um, tell us a little bit about that and what you're learning and what you're excited about with that. Um, sure. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question also. Um, so the institute that is funding my research is located in Baltimore. Um, the work is because of uh, the pandemic is pretty virtual right at the moment. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited about is this is a project where we're really focusing on, on women's views and looking at all kinds of expressive arts. Uh, it, it's uh, my firm belief that women have insights and understandings that are different than men and the, they're different than the dominant culture. And so we need to uh, lift up these voices. Uh, part of this uh, project will create a traveling exhibit of art that will go to um, hospitals uh, around the nation, I hope. That's what the plan says. And um, the whole purpose of that will be to raise awareness about the linkages between human health and planetary health. And what better place than a hospital where you're thinking about your health, you care about your health, you're, you're kind of in a perfect moment to hear that message that your health is related to the plant's health. And hopefully to make those kinds of commitments 
to those daily decisions. You know, I was speaking about this idea that there are daily decisions that um, we make that alter the course of our own trajectory if we all make decisions that are thoughtful about the earth, we can alter the trajectory for the earth. So that's the, that's the message, that's the big message. Um, and um, I'm really excited about getting into the arts. My first degree was a Bachelor of Fine Arts and Drama. So, and, uh, so I, it's great to be exploring my own expressive side, but also to be being influenced by artists and, and others who are part of this program, uh, part of this team with me. Okay, um, I have a question from my guest in the gallery. And uh -huh. she asks, do you have any recordings of Key's voice speaking or telling stories? Do you have any audio recordings, oral? So I see Carol uh, Larson raising her hand. I I know that there are that there are recordings. Carol, do you want to uh, unmute and and answer that? Yes, we have recordings on CD, um, and like the books, it's a very nominal fee for a CD, uh, five dollars plus the mailing charge, and. Um, you know, they weren't always done in the best circumstances. There's some you where you can hear the fire crackling in the background or you can hear children crying. Um, but they're Grandmother Key and they're her telling the stories as only she could. Um, many of the same stories you saw listed that uh, uh, Weetan Lee Boisfort um, also sells the printed versions. Thank you. Um, there was a question from Anne in the audience. Anne, are you still there? Would you like to unmute your mic? Okay, Anne's- We oh, got it, yeah, we got it, okay. Whoa. <laughs> one of you, ladies, one of you should close your monitor since you're on two different screens. Oh, you, you just go ahead and read it. I'll read it. <laughs> Okay. It's pretty spooky. So that happens to me when a couple of people are trying to Zoom at the same room at the same meeting. We're not. I don't know why there's two of us. We didn't do that. But anyway, would you just go ahead and read it, please? Yes. Did you find information in medical literature about balsam fir? So uh, I, I'm thinking this is you're asking me to remember something that I did um, <clears throat> a, a lot of years ago, <laughs> um, which is kind of funny. You realize you do this research and then you realize you can't remember it. Actually, you have to go refresh your mind. What I found uh, about balsam fir was science about it because it's it was used um, as an an a, a a fixative for um, slides, slide covers on slides because of its clarity. And so there was science like information about it, but not um, medical information. And with, with other herbs, you can find things that there may be, there's chemistry that makes sense. There's biochemistry or something like that that makes sense and, and gives you a clue as to how this particular herb is, is affecting the body. Okay, we had one more from Carol. Um, Carol, did you wanna ask again about the question on interconnectedness? Yeah, I wondered, um, cause you had talked a good deal about philosophy and the philosophy that he said she could never, you know, you can't take it apart from the medicine, um, mm -hmm. the physical or the spiritual. Right. And now that we've been living through a global pandemic I was wondering if you could speak to the core of her philosophy of interconnectedness in, in light of what we've seen over the last year. Mm. I a, don't ask light questions, you know. Yeah, I was just going to say, thanks. Thank you again for a <laughs> great question. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, I think that I think, well, one of the things that we are learning from the pandemic is about our interconnectedness, particularly with nature. One of one of the things that I think is really telling is that, in fact, uh, all of these viruses that have come up in the in the last 10 or so years, 10 or 15 years, that could have been pandemics, but got kept local. They are happening because of our encroachment into uh, uh, regions where uh, we've come into closer and closer contact with other animals who have no choice but to be there. They're, they're, they can't get away. We're moving out all the time. We're constantly pushing those boundaries out. And as that contact increases, then the likelihood of the viral jump from uh, animal to uh, human, it just the, the chances just go up. And so all the time there are constantly viruses jumping and some of them are such that then the humans can transmit them to other humans. And that's, that's, those are the ones that become the uh, epidemics or in this case, the pandemic. The other piece that I think that we've learned is because we had to shut, shut down a global, really a globe had to shut down. I, it's been sort of staggered in different countries at different times. There was evidence of less pollution, particularly in China, which is a very um, high industrial uh, polluter at this point in time. There's many stories of animals returning to city streets, of fish returning to uh, waters where they had not be seen, been seen. Um, this speaks to this message from the scarlet tanager of we are dying, but we will return. As long as there are some left, as long as we can pull back and, and literally we need to pull back, we need to pull back into a simpler way of life. We need to pull back into a way of respect and harmony with nature. If we can do that, nature can regenerate. Nature is prolific. Think of the quote unquote weeds in your yard. They are prolific. They will just create and create and create. And so we're the ones that have to do something about our own behavior. We have the mind to do that. We have the mind to make it other decisions. And now is the time. Now is the time to examine our decisions and to call our leaders to examine their, their decisions, to stand together and speak and examine our decisions because every one of them matters. Every one, every day, all day long. So we have a question from Marilyn and she is not able to um, use the microphone, <clears throat> but she would like to know if there's any chance she can get or see a copy of the piece you read asking, what would Key say? <laughs> Here we go. It's in my, it's in my journal. Um, I would, um, I'm, I'm looking over at my webmaster um, who's on, on, on one side of this, uh, is, is in one of the little boxes. And maybe we can do something to get that up on our web. The, the project um, that I was talking about with the, the women's voices and the expressive voices, we have a website that is called mutualreawakening.org. And uh, there's a lot of interesting things there. And um, 
maybe maybe we can put that up on that uh, website. Very good. Another question it, is, it, are there, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Were you finished, Sarah? No, I was, I was just getting signaled from the uh, webmaster's partner. Okay. <laughs> are there any photographs of Grandmother Key available? I know the Historical Society does have some. Um, does the drum have any that they sell of her or copies of them? I have to tell you, I had, I just, I, in thinking about this talk, I went looking for pictures of Key mm -hmm. um, and looking online, and there are very, very few. And um, looking, you know, that's part of why I, I focused in on ones that I had myself. I don't know about, I don't think there's any that are for sale. Um, and I'm getting a head shake from somebody who should know Karen Arndorfer. Did you want to unmute Karen? There aren't any for sale, but Rob has something to add to it. I've downloaded photographs of Key from the Beaver Island Historical Society website. Mm -hmm. uh, One of good. the ones that was displayed earlier of her in a uh, lovely decorated dress with uh, a fan and a rattle and a wagon um, is on that website. Great. Thank you. So you could just email the Historical Society and I will check in my files and maybe I can make a digital file and share some of them. Um, I will not charge for them. So just, you'll have to just reach back out to me. Uh, you can just email bihistory.director at gmail.com and I'll share whatever um, I have in the file with you. Um, and I guess the last thing that, let me scroll down to the bottom and make sure it's the last. Um, there is a question about whether or not this presentation will be, uh, the recording will be available to the public. And right now I cannot answer that. Uh, Sarah and I decided that I would record it. And then after this program was finished, we would, you know, go back and um, have a little chat and make sure that all the content is appropriate for sharing. So you might just check back on our website or our YouTube channel, which you can get to off of our website as well. And if it's available, it will be uploaded. And I guess that would be the end. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us, or should I say Dr. Sarah? I, um, it was <laughs> a very well-informed presentation, and I'm thrilled to have you as our speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank Great to see so many friends uh, on the screen, and uh, hopefully new friends uh, that we haven't already met yet. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good evening, everybody.